I'd like to run something past you. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'd just like to get a feel from the live audience as well. If I were to say to you, you've got a high stakes uh, test coming up very shortly, would you be either terrified or relaxed? And what I'd like is a show of hands now, just for the people who'd feel relaxed. Could you just put your hands up if you feel relaxed? Okay, very scientific poll on that. Um, I checked this on Twitter um, about 10 days or so ago, and it was broadly similar to what you're saying in this live session. And the vast majority of people are extremely uh, uncomfortable at the prospect of something which is high stakes and high threat. And what I want to unpack in this session is how we might create the conditions for high challenge and low threat. Now, thank you again, the next one, that the uh, responses from the people who were uh, asked that gave a very sort of prickly, uncomfortable, um, really um, distressing uh, thought of something which is high challenge and high threat. And um, what I would like to um, put to you is that there will also be people in this audience, both you yourselves individually and people at home, that you can think of who are doing things like Sudoku, who are doing things like crosswords, who are doing things like word searches in their own time and enjoying it. So my question is, why is it that in our own time, we're prepared to test ourselves? And what I'm arguing is that we actually enjoy doing things that have got a bit of meat to them, that are interesting, are challenging, that we can throw ourselves into, and that actually there are companies that are making millions of pounds out of the fact that essentially we like testing ourselves. So what I want to unpack is actually what might be going on here, that in the right conditions, we do actually like putting ourselves under pressure. But before I do, I think it's worth saying that it's possible, too, to have low challenge and low threat. And um, I was thinking, as I was hearing people talking about aspiration and inspiring people, all our young people, and of course, that's all a really worthwhile ambition, and I'm sure we've all been on the receiving end of the opposite. And in fact, when I was 11, and I went to my first physics lesson at the age of 11, the physics mistress said to us, she said, put up your hands, those of you who would, um, are considering taking physics at A-level. This was our first lesson. And I didn't put my hand up, because I had no idea. I didn't know what physics was going to be involved in. And um, so those girls that put their hands up, she brought them to the front and never spoke to the rest of us for the rest of the three years. So I obviously didn't take that for O-level, because I'm old enough to have done O-levels. And um, similarly, the biology teacher, we figured out really early on that we weren't going to get the answers to reproduction in this very closed convent, uh, because we asked her, so she wrote herself out of any kind of higher aspirations for me as far as taking her subject was concerned. So those are examples of low challenge and low threat. But um, what I want to um, argue, the converse to that, is that essentially, if we're prepared to test ourselves under certain conditions, that we are a challenge-seeking species. We're a challenge-seeking species. And what I want to explore in the next few minutes is what that looks like in settings primarily, and then a bit more in terms of what is happening in the classroom. Thank you. The next one. We're prepared to do this, to put ourselves under stress, un under the right sort of stress, when there's nobody making us feel like a Muppet. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't ever want to be able to be made to feel a Muppet. It's a really uncomfortable place and space to be. And my role in whatever I'm doing whether it's with children or with adults, then I'm always trying to create the space where it's possible to be both robust and kind. And what I notice when I'm going around um, schools that they are, and other settings, is that the wise leaders are able to create the space where this can happen. Thank you, the next one. Um, 
It's a space where adults and children are led by people who understand the difference between the work and the person. And what they're able to do, these wise leaders, is they're able to create an atmosphere where it's okay to be me, where it's okay to make mistakes, and where we distinguish the work from the person. And what these wise leaders do is they make sure that they pay due attention to relationships. Relationships are at the heart of successful enterprises, whether we're talking business or whether we're talking education. If they've done that work first, in a sense what they've done is they've built up a bank balance of goodwill. They're in the black, as it were, and it means when they need to have tough conversations, they're able to distinguish and say, actually, in terms of this piece of work, we need to have a conversation. And they're humble about it. They acknowledge their own mistakes as well. Um, thank you, the next one. What we know is, um, for our children, is that the, uh, and, and for adults, is that really nobody is setting out to do a rubbish job. I don't know anyone who's setting out to do a rubbish job. Do you? Um, but in our journeys of um, improvement and in doing great work, there will be things that need to be corrected um, en route. But what I'm going to argue too is that um, a lot of our work in schools is actually trying to make um, the stuff too easy um, for our children. And that too much of what we're doing is watering it down, um, mashing it up, instead of giving them some really hard, meaty things to do. I'm going to um, draw on first the work of Daniel Willingham, um, who is a cognitive uh, scientist. He's professor of um, psychology at um, University in Virginia. And uh, for the last 15 years, he's been applying the principles of cognitive science to um, education. And he's very good because he's, his, his, uh, his position is always tentative. He's always saying, well, at the moment, this is what the research is saying, and this is what we might do as a result of it. Nothing is ever absolutely cast in stone, and that's a very healthy space to be, both for scientists and for all of us in general. But essentially, what his work has found is that testing, which they've now rebranded as retrieval practice, I know which I prefer. Uh, anyway, I think testing's actually sexier, but there we go. Is that, um, is that in the very process of testing ourselves under the right conditions and of teachers testing children under the right conditions, high challenge, low threat, the very process of trying to retrieve the information is actually where the learning is going on. And there are a lot of people who are thinking about this um, very creatively now, both in the States and in this country. And um, uh, some lovely work is coming out of it. Now, um, Michael Fordham um, wrote a very, he's a history teacher in a London school, and he wrote a really interesting blog this week about why we are dressing up our subjects, why we're not just offering them completely as they are in the beauty and the magnificence of what of what they are. And he recounts a really great story from when he was um, a newly qualified teacher. And um, he was talking about the fact that his, um, he, he always wanted to do um, word searches, get into odd role plays. There's a place for role plays, I have to say, but they were odd. They were, they were tangential to the, to the real meat. What were the children actually learning? And he came to one day and he found actually that the um, the children um, at year eight, he hadn't got time to do all sorts of whizzy, wacky, um, farting around basically with fancy photocopiers. We've all done it, haven't we? And um, what a waste of time. And so he just sat and told them about what he taught his A-level group. And what he was absolutely astonished, and this was the last thing on a Friday, and we've all been there, was that, the, um, was that they hung on his every word. Why? because he was giving them the real meat and the real substance, and he wasn't trying to dress it up. Similarly, Andy Tharby, who's another great uh, blogger who is worth um, following, he talks about just the text is the beating heart of his classroom practice. 
He doesn't try and dress it up. And he's very, very honest. He says sometimes when you're getting into a new text, it's a bit like being a bit arthritic. But actually, with the movement, everyone gets drawn in. And the final example I just want to give very quickly is that I've got colleagues who are working with uh, children at Key Stage 1 on salvation and incarnation because they're determined not to dumb down and to diminish you know, what their chil our children are entitled to. Beautiful example again from Key Stage 1. I'm doing quite a lot of work at the moment on prevent British values, human values really, aren't they? Uh, and spiritual, moral, social, and cultural development. And a lot of this talk is about democratic processes and the, ch the extent to which our children have the chance to take part in democratic processes. Beautiful example um, of a key stage one, a year one teacher, where in order to um, decide where the children were going to go out on two options for a trip, bowl of pebbles, and a child, each child took one and put it in the bowl where they wanted it to go. Now, and, of course, it was quite clear which option they were going to go on, so it was entirely understood how those decisions were made. But more importantly, that teacher was tapping into a deep democratic process, explaining to the children about how pebbles were used in Greek democracy, and that, indeed, the Greek word for pebble is cephos, and that's the term the sophologists are the experts on voting patterns. So what she was doing was giving them an entitlement to um, a really big thing. She wasn't watering it down in the least. And linked to that, I'm arguing that we should be asking our children to get into the roots, the etymology of words, to make the, 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 the story around what we're teaching the children both much more robust, much more difficult, but offering them the possibilities of having high challenge and low threat. So my final um, offer to you is that this is worthwhile stuff. It's much more rewarding. It's also going to save us some time because our children are going to be doing more of the work. And then to paraphrase that really cheesy advert, it is because I think we're all worth it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.